In the Northern Ireland conflict, spying was a very dangerous game. Physical violence, I don't think it's now. mental violence, obviously. The IRA's chief interrogator explains how he extracted confessions from informers before they were shot. Standard procedure is to strip and debug them just to see if they're, they're wired up or whatever it is. Except that for years, the interrogator was himself one of Britain's most important spies. We get you into a room, the blame for it. They strip me. Codename Steak Knife. He was unmasked in 2003. Real name, Freddy Scappatici. I'll be sitting there, right? Know the room's cold. They make you all sorts of promises. Now, Steak Knife and his spy masters are the subject of a major criminal inquiry. Were fellow spies sacrificed so that he could continue to spy? Our panorama investigation suggests they were. Everybody being what they are, everybody's a breaking point. I don't think they're going to go home, but they don't. This is Milltown Cemetery in Belfast. The Northern Ireland conflict cost 3,700 lives. Many are buried here, along with many secrets. In one corner are the graves of those revered as heroes by the IRA. Elsewhere, the graves of those shot by the IRA as British spies. But in the murky world of agents and informers, some things are not quite what they seem. Officially, the Northern Ireland conflict was not a war. In truth, it was sometimes waged by the intelligence services as if it was. This is the story of how far the intelligence services compromised their peacetime values in an effort to beat the IRA. A story that some have been determined should never see the light of day. The IRA spent nearly three decades trying to bomb the British out of Northern Ireland. This was the markets area of Belfast, a tight-knit Republican community where Freddie Scappatici lived. Freddie Scappatici was a household name, a uh, very well-respected figure in the markets. He would have been the commander of the provisional IRA in the, the markets area. Anthony McIntyre joined the IRA under Freddie Scappatici's command. You knew he was in the room. I mean, uh, you could look around the whole room and you would have stopped at the Scappatici because he was somebody who was looked up to, somebody who was admired. <laughs> When Republicans were detained without trial in 1971, Freddy Scappatici was one of them. He was amongst the most senior IRA members to be held and one of the last to be released four years later. He was soon back in trouble with the law. I've learned that Scappatici got himself involved in a large VAT fraud in the building trade. He was a bricklayer by trade. The police fraud squad arrested him uh, but rather than charge him, he did a deal. He agreed to become a police informer. The IRA had also appointed him to a new unit to root out informers called internal security. One of its first victims was a young IRA volunteer called Michael Kearney. I'm on my way to meet a close relative who was also in the IRA. He wants to remain anonymous. The countdown to Kearney's death began when he and a friend were picked up by the army and handed over to the police, the Royal Ulster Constabulary. His friend later testified that he could hear Michael getting a really hard time. He seemed to be getting thrown against the walls because the walls were vibrating and they were shouting and screaming, banging tables. Three days later, Kenny broke 
and disclosed to the police the location of a small explosives dump. Uh, the British Army and the RUC in a combined operation raided the flat that night and recovered the explosives. Instead of charging Kearney, the police turned him loose. By lifting the dump, they were actually fingering him, basically sending word to the IRA to say this is the one that lifted the dump, or this is the one to give away on this particular dump. A detective had warned that if Kearney was released, he risked being shot as a spy. The police put it to the vote, three to one, in favor of his release. Sure enough, within 48 hours, Kearney was ordered to report to the IRA's internal security unit. He was driven south to the Irish border. Kearney was questioned by a team of interrogators, including Freddy Scapatici. After 16 days, he was released, or so he thought. They actually had given him a drink. They had actually told him that he was going home to his mother and he would be heading due north shortly. Instead of heading north back to Belfast, the van carrying Kearney headed west along the border. And when they reached a place called McGuire's Bridge, it was there that he was told quite candidly that he was to be executed. How do you know that? All right, Homer. Uh, he got out of the vehicle and I've been told he wasn't bound or gagged or, uh, or hooded in any way. His executioner he said that he accepted it as a soldier. Michael asked to say a prayer and he was allowed to while the guy loaded up and as he was praying he was shot twice in the back of the head at close range. Michael Canney had just turned 20 when he was shot by the IRA after being interrogated by Scapatici. The IRA have since acknowledged he was never a spy. With the blood of Michael Kearney on his hands, two months later, Scapatici graduated from being an informer with the police fraud squad to a paid agent with military intelligence. The British now had a spy at the very heart of the IRA, with unique access to its high command and its war plans. I mean, the security department, they know everything about the IRA. They are like an electrical junction box through which every wire must flow. If the British put somebody in there, the British really have the wedding tackle of the IRA firmly in their hands. I mean, it's a brilliant, brilliant strategy. As a British agent, Scapatici was given a number, 6126, and a code name, Steak Knife. He was now feeding back to his army handlers what the IRA leadership were thinking and planning and which of their agents were at risk of being shot by the internal security unit, otherwise known as the Nutting Squad. Why the Nutting Squad? Because everybody who ended up being shot dead, a bullet in the head, a bullet in the nut, had to pass through the security department before they would end up getting uh, killed. Touting or informing on the IRA was the most reviled thing that any Republican could do. Who knows what motivated Freddy Scapatici to turn traitor to the Republican cause. I gather he told his British Army handlers that he disliked gratuitous violence. Still, that doesn't seem to have stopped him from preparing his fellow agents for death, and sometimes pretty barbaric deaths at that. The next few years saw a sharp rise in IRA executions of suspected informers, which today are being investigated by Operation Canova, the £35 million criminal inquiry centred on steak knife. Yeah, I would be sent. Scap's good for business. That's keep him, you know. He's, he's proving himself. Yep, he, he, he's worth his little. He's bloodied. Yeah. 
Vincent Robinson was another of the Nutting Squad's victims. His battered body was dumped in the rubbish chute of a tar block. The Scapatici and the Robinson families had been neighbors. The Robinsons insist Vincent was never a spy. According to their lawyer, Scapatici assured them Vincent had not suffered in his final moments. Sometime after the killing of Vincent Robinson, Mr. Scapatici gave an absolute assurance that he wasn't subjected to any form of torture. Kevin Winters represents many of the families whose relatives were murdered by the Nutting Squad. So the family took that at face value and accepted that. And that was their understanding for a number of years. Was it true? Well, as it turns out, it wasn't true. Because the inquest papers make it very clear that Vincent Robinson was, in fact, subjected to the most horrendous torture. He was kicked in the stomach and he was struck on the side of the head anything up to five times, smashing in a skull. I spoke to several ex-IRA men for whom the name Scapatici still spells dread. I've come to meet one of them who wants to stay anonymous. What kind of reputation did uh, Scapatici have within the IRA? It was massive. It was big. How did most IRA volunteers think of him? They were afraid of him. <laughs> Absolutely. Because? His interrogation tactics. Hang you upside down. Not allowed to sleep. But he always seemed to get the job done. Do you know people who were interrogated by him? Yeah, yeah. And what did they say about him? He said he was a bastard. Being a bastard was how Steakknife maintained his cover. We had to know where the threat level was, the strengths and weaknesses of the people we were actually dealing with. For five years, Ray White headed Special Branch in Belfast, working closely with MI5 and military intelligence. Back then, spy technology was nothing like as sophisticated as it is today. The biggest reliance actually was on having uh, an individual within the organizations. So the two-legged source, span large, meeting, as it were, with his handlers was our bread and butter. Both security sources and former members of the IRA here in West Belfast have told me Scapatici became head of the nutting squad during the 1980s. Culling agents was, of course, one of the squad's key tasks. So Scavadici's British Army handlers can have been in absolutely no doubt that he was involved in the murder of his fellow agents time and time again. No matter what the, the handler uh, basically cautions the agent, once he steps back into the paramilitary world, he has to be a model terrorist. He has to abide by the instructions that the organization gives him in every respect. The bottom line is you don't get intelligence from uh, milkmaids. That seems to be what you're saying. That's the aspect that even some of our colleagues today find a wee bit hard to sort of come to terms with, that you're actually doing deals with people who, as I say, had blood on their hands. A lot of blood while Scapatici was in the nutting squad. Operation Canova, the new investigation into Steak Knife, was triggered by Northern Ireland's Director of Public Prosecutions on receipt of a classified report. It made for very disturbing and chilling reading. It paints a picture of an intelligence gathering operation at the upper levels of the IRA, during which many, many terrible things happened. Can you say roughly how many murders the evidence so far suggests the Asian state knife was involved in or linked to? To some extent or another, yes, there is a connection between the agent known as state knife uh, uh, and at least 18 murders. That's a lot of murders. It is a lot of murders and it goes back quite a period of time. So you were in the special branch in Belfast for 11 years. You must have lost some agents in that time. We did. Any 
How many? Can't say. We lost agents. What was the loss of an agent like? It was a hammer blow. Um, it was a tremendous, as it were, psychological and emotional blow to those people that were the handlers. For the relatives of those shot as informers, it's been a life sentence. Ryan Hegarty was just five when his father was murdered. He learnt about this from the television news. Mr. Hegarty was shot in the head. His hands were tied behind his back. Well, I recognise his clothes mm -hmm. because they were wearing the same clothes uh, when I had last seen him. That has a an imprinting factor on my my life and also on my head. It's been love and hell to be truthful with you because we've had a love of the stigma what I was shot for. Frank Hegarty was an army agent who gave the British the location of rifles and ammunition in 1986. Nobody likes traders or agents and formers or whatever. And what were the sort of things that were said to you? Oh, it'll be up the area. Up the row, we got your da. We got your da. Uh -huh. mm. Taunting you. Oh, exactly. Yes. Could Frank Hegarty's life have been saved? Scapatici has said he knew Hegarty was going to be shot. Sometimes Scapatici didn't tell his army handlers all he knew but sometimes he did. Are you able to say whether any of the agents you did lose, intelligence services, were forewarned by steak knife that they were at risk? If I answered that question, I would be identifying the individuals that um, were there, and as there's an ongoing investigation into those things, that's an aspect I would just leave on the table. At the heart of that investigation, Operation Canova, is this question. Were British agents allowed to die to protect Steak Knife's cover? Good morning, Beverly Police. How can I help? Former counter-terrorism detective John Boucher, now Chief Constable of Bedfordshire, is leading a team of 50 detectives. Is there any evidence so far that suggests the intelligence agencies had the opportunity to save their lives, but for one reason or another didn't take that opportunity? There are families that believe that their loved ones' deaths could have been prevented. There could have been state intervention. Now, again, that's not straightforward. We need to look at the circumstances of what may or may not been known by those state actors, those state forces, when, and what opportunities they may or may not have had to do anything. Scapatici was run by a special department within British military intelligence called the Force Research Unit, or FRU. They regarded him as their golden egg. The police special branch also ran agents, and one of their agents, Joe Fenton, ran an estate agency around here. The special branch paid Fenton to set up the agency ideal homes to provide the IRA with safe houses, which MI5 then bugged. This yielded arrests and weapons fines. By the summer of 1988, the IRA was suspicious. The special branch reported that Scapatici was going to lead an IRA investigation into every job Joe Fenton has been involved in over the years to establish whether or not he was a British agent. I understand that Fenton was summoned to see Scapatici here at Sinn Féin's advice centre in Belfast's Lower Falls. When Fenton emerged, he was dishevelled, and he told a relative, if I go missing, call a priest. Six months later, Scapatici sent for him again. On the Saturday morning, he told his wife that he was going on a message. It turned out that he was going to a house in Lenadoon in West Belfast, where he met a number of people, 
um, including Fred Scapatici. And as it turns out, uh, that was the last time that he saw his wife. The owner of the house in Lena Dune was a Republican sympathizer. He had been approached by the IRA and, and asked would he make his house available for an, an interrogation, which he agreed to do. He provided a bedroom for them upstairs in his house. Waiting to interrogate Fenton was Scapatici. Standard procedure is to strip them and debug them just to see if they're, they're wired up and usually put a border suit on them there, put them in a chair, face the wall, right, and then go from there. Scapatici was once secretly recorded explaining his technique for extracting confessions. They get you into the room, the blindfold, right? Strip me. They'll have you sitting there, right? Know the room's cold. They make you all sorts of promises. The homeowner later described the scene to police. You could hear banging, fighting, and uh, a lot of violence for a long time. Fenton had put up one hell of a fight before everything went quiet. Presumably, he'd been maybe gagged, bound, or whatever. And everybody being what they are, everybody's a at that point. You know? Fenton was kept for another day after Scapatici had broken him into confessing he was a special branch agent. At 7 p.m., Fenton was led outside. Approaching a footpath, he made a desperate run for it. His executioner fired a shot that hit him in the back, then held him down and shot him three times in the head. I understand that Scapatici had told his handlers that he was going to interrogate Joe Fenton again and warn them he won't survive this one. Well, if that's the case and if that's correct, the obligation on the part of handlers or whoever else was more than a moral obligation to look after the life of that individual. It went beyond that. And if that's the case and there was prior knowledge and nothing was done to intervene, well, that veers into the realms of criminal liability. Do you know why Joe Fenton's life was not saved? I'm not going to speak about specific cases. Um, that is one of the um, murders that we are investigating. That's within the terms of reference of Operation Canova. But I'm not going to be able to discuss at this stage um, the issues around that particular death. While the Army's Force Research Unit, the FRU, were responsible for steak knife, the police special branch were responsible for Joe Fenton, two British intelligence agencies with two different priorities. Did steak knife's intelligence take precedence? I understand that when the special branch received his intelligence, the Army usually required this caveat. No action to be taken without direct reference to Fru. Fru sources have told me that Steak Knife was providing a continuous flow of intelligence that was saving many other lives. Does that become a factor in terms of your analysis? Uh, you know, is there going to be a greater loss of life coming down the line? It really is a moral maze and a moral conundrum as to how you actually balance out. There must have been occasions when members of the intelligence services had to play God. You had to decide which life you were going to save. Did you confront those decisions, sort of decisions? The, those decisions were there. Thankfully, they were, as it were, rare. But in the one or two circumstances that, uh, as I say, that uh, I do have a, a recollection of, as I say, we, we did our utmost. And that's the question for Canova. Did the intelligence services always do their utmost for all their agents? 
we need to understand what was the rationale and decision making of one person being allowed to die in order, potentially, if this was the case, that another person can live. What, what do you say to those people now investigating the past who weren't confronted with the sort of moral dilemmas that you've outlined? Well, first thing I say, consider yourself lucky that you didn't have uh, the decisions to make. Ten months after Joe Fenton's death, Scapatici was back at the same house interrogating another special branch agent, Sandy Lynch. It was January 1990. Lynch later described his ordeal to the police. I heard a voice who I believed to be Scabatici, and then he said, do you know who I am, Sandy? And I said, yes. He said, I don't give two fucks because where you're going, you'll not be telling no one. Scapatici told Lynch he'd end up dead like Fenton if he didn't confess. He said, if he had his way, I would get a jab up the arse and waking up in God's country, hung upside down in a cow shed, that he'd skin me alive and that no one would hear me squealing. As with Fenton, Scapatici warned his army handlers there was to be an execution. But unlike Fenton, this time, the cavalry was sent in. As dusk gathered, security forces rescued Lynch and arrested five IRA men holding him. What state was he in when you got to interview him? He was exhausted. He hadn't been fed. His eyes were... He'd been blindfolded for almost all of the time. Do you think the IRA did intend to shoot him? I've obviously no doubt about that. The unanswered question is why this time was the cavalry sent in, when just as before with Fenton, there was a direct risk to State Knife's cover. All we do know is that three months previously, an English policeman had been called over to Belfast to investigate the undercover war. John Stevens was then Deputy Chief Constable of Cambridgeshire. Mr Stevens, can you tell us how your inquiry is going at the moment? Well, I was called over here to do a totally independent, impartial inquiry and into criminal allegations, and it's progressing pretty well at the present time. When do you uh, expect... The army tried to put Stevens off the scent. Did you know that military intelligence ran agents? No, we were told the opposite. Uh, when we first went into Northern Ireland, we were told that the army did not run any agents whatsoever. That was a flat lie? Yes. Stephen's officers were finalising plans for a key arrest when Lynch was rescued. Do you, do you think there might be a relationship between the fact that, just as you were about to make an arrest, the intelligence services put on a showcase performance by rescuing Sandy Lynch? I, I wouldn't like to speculate on that, but all you can say is that when, when our activities took place, there was a certain amount of panic going on in the intelligence community, that's for sure. That panic was the start of multiple attempts by elements of the security services to cover Steak Knife's tracks. When detectives searched the house, they found Scapatici's fingerprints on the battery of a device he'd used to check if Lynch was wearing a bug. So Scapatici then went on your wanted list? He went on the wanted list and disappeared from public view. I'm told Scapatici fled across the border to a Dublin suburb. He was facing up to eight years in jail. When you issued the warrant for Freddy Scapatici's arrest, yeah. were you told by the special branch or any of the intelligence agencies that he was in fact a British agent? No. There was, however, one very senior police officer who did know all about Steak Knife. Now he rode to the army's rescue. According to an army report, which I gather has been discovered, this police officer suggested that Scapatici should concoct an alibi. So he sent a message to the joint owner of the house where Lynch had been held, asking her if she would be prepared to say that he'd been in her house doing electrical work. 
she agreed. False alibi now in place. Scapatici headed home, back to Belfast. He was promptly arrested and taken to Castlereagh Interrogation Centre. To my surprise, he actually spoke. He denied being involved with, with uh, in the Lynch kidnapping and interrogation, and he accounted for this thumbprint being there. And he said, um, well, I did electrical work. Without the alibi, would you charge? Yeah, Scapatici would have been charged, yes. Detectives investigating Nutting Squad murders might also have been able to charge the gunmen, had they known their names. But this intelligence was often withheld, even though there were some 30 executions during Scapatici's time. Well, what we're talking about here are almost parallel processes. We have one uh, in which there's a police investigation, but all along there is an entirely secret dimension to these events. Now, uh, th th that, that drives a coach on horses through the rule of law. It means that those who carried out these murders were not properly investigated or brought to justice. So for me, that is an appalling vista. Within the IRA's high command, the rescue of Sandy Lynch had aroused deep suspicion of a traitor in their midst. Scapatici was a prime suspect. I understand his position in the security unit was reviewed by Spike Murray, the IRA's most senior man in Belfast. Scapatici was removed. Why wasn't he shot? He was too big to fail. They could not expose the fact to their volunteers that the guy who was tasked by the leadership with protecting the volunteers and security of the IRA was doing anything but. I also think that, so he, he there was a self-interest in the part of the IRA in not exposing them uh, and not shooting them because it would have invited an awful lot of questions to the IRA and to the leadership that had held them in place for so long. Out of power, Scapatici took his revenge. In August 1993, ITV broadcast an expose about the head of the IRA's Northern Command. The man who controls the IRA, James Martin McGuinness. The next day, Scapatici arranged to meet the program makers. Calling himself Jack, he met them in the car park of this hotel just outside Belfast. He arrived in a very crisp, newly ironed white shirt and, and dark slacks. He's fairly self-assured, stocky, um, short, dark hair, receding hair. Scapatici then vented his anger on the senior IRA members who were blocking his return to the IRA, including Martin McGuinness, who's recently died. He's a very cold person. He doesn't have friends within the IRA. He has what he calls comrades, but he doesn't have friends as such. Asked how he knew all this, Scapatici gave this wistful response. Well, I know it because, if we want to be straight, I was at the heart of things right. for a long time, right? right? Right. I'm no longer at the heart of things, right? I haven't been for a few, two or three years, right? But I know what I'm talking about. We asked him how he felt about now not being at the heart of things, and he said, there's more to life than killing. You asked him if, he, if he'd actually ever killed anyone, and he was, what was his reaction? He was evasive, and we were un, all under the impression um, that he clearly had. When the special branch learned who Jack was, they told the journalists if they broadcast his voice, he'd be shot, so they didn't. And there, Scapatici's secret life might have stayed secret, but for a former member of the Army's Force Research Unit. Ian Hurst left the FRU in 1990. Nine years later, inspired, so he says, by a new moral imperative, he told the Sunday Times the British had a major agent, codename Steakknife. I didn't join the Intelligence Corps to conspire 
to commit criminal offences. Nobody has that dispensation. Nobody has a license to kill. Meaning? Oh, meaning, I suppose, the greater good, which is the old adage uh, of, you know, you lose one life, but you save a hundred. It was 1999, and John Stevens was back investigating the undercover war. Hearst was interviewed by Stevens, who later sought access to Steak Knife's files from Army Headquarters, Northern Ireland. The documentation was a limited amount of documentation, and most of the documents had actually been destroyed, uh, the Army said, through uh, normal, regular procedures of getting rid of documentation, which uh, they didn't need. Mm. Do you believe that? Well, that's what they said, and uh, I don't know. In 2003, Hearst upped the ante. Now he leaked Steak Knife's real identity to the newspapers. Scappatici was spirited out of Belfast and flown to England, where, I gather, MI5 offered him protective security, which he declined, confident he could bluff it out. He calculated that the IRA had every reason to support him if he denied he was a spy. And he was right. The, the IRM Freddie Scapatici at that time had uh, a mutual dependence on each other and a mutual interest in this story not coming out and in this story been rubbish. Scapatici flew back to Belfast. There, he sought a meeting with the IRA leadership. They came to an understanding. This led to a call to a BBC correspondent. At the time, it all seemed a bit last minute, uh, spontaneous. Um, I went to West Belfast. Uh, that's when I met Freddie Scapatici. He gave me a bit of a glance and a bit of a, bit of a look. Scapatici portrayed himself as an ordinary citizen, so insulted by the slur that he was a spy, he'd no choice but to go to a solicitor. My statement basically is that I am Freddie Scapatici. I'm sitting here today with my solicitor. I'm telling you I'm not guilty of any of these allegations. And I suppose my thinking about that now, I, there was no sense of nervousness in his voice because he's delivering a prepared script that he knows people are on board for. Why do you think this labelled steak knife has been attached to you? I don't know. And, and just one final question. Were you at any stage a member of the IRA and involved in the Republican movement? Um, I was involved in the Republican movement 13 years ago. But I have no involvement this past 13 years. And what about the allegations? Sorry. Sorry. That's, just, that's just finished. That's just finished. You, 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 got, you got three. The British Army's master um, spy had put on uh, a bravura performance. Just one thing Sorry. I would like... Uh, no, turn the camera off. Yes, yes, but then his performance had been choreographed by the IRA from start to finish. I'm told the IRA's head of intelligence was watching from across the street. I think it wasn't about saving Freddie Scapatici's life. I think it was about saving the skin of the IRA's reputation. Normality had returned to Northern Ireland. The IRA claimed to have fought the British to an honourable draw, instead of being pushed into peace, paralysed by the penetration of agents like Steak Knife. They were uh, lauding their peace process as a serious victory. Uh, now we're seeing that the man who helped make the peace process possible was none other than Freddie Scapatici, a senior British agent at the heart of the IRA. As for Scapatici, his chutzpah knew no bounds. Now he demanded ministers deny he was steak knife. But the government wasn't about to end a decades-long convention. Further comment was made about the question of steak knife. Honourable members of the House will not be surprised if I say that I will not comment on intelligence matters. So Scapatici took the government to court. He lost. But crucially, I understand, he told a lie by swearing on oath an affidavit to say he was not steak knife. 
And then Scapatici's nemesis returned, demanding the police investigate him for perjury. What was their initial reaction? Indifference, uh, bordering on incredulity, um, and which culminated in one, once put under pressure to, to come to a decision which took an almighty amount of time. Um, quote unquote, it was uninvestigatable. How a, 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 a allegation, because that's what it is, it's only an allegation of perjury, is uninvestigatable is beyond my comprehension. It either is a fact or it isn't. Reluctantly, the police conducted an inquiry, which I'm told was cursory. In 2007, they sent a file to the Northern Ireland Director of Public Prosecutions. The DPP decided not to prosecute Scapatici for perjury on the grounds that even if he had lied to the High Court, he'd genuinely feared for his life, leaving him no choice but to lie. And yet, Scapatici had voluntarily returned to Belfast to do a deal with the IRA, and he'd rejected MI5's offer of protective custody. In 2015, the new DPP, Bara McGrory QC, also seems to have noted a contradiction. I have serious concerns in relation to this decision. I understand a senior lawyer involved in taking that decision was the DPP's deputy, Pamela Acheson. She is no longer at her desk. But can you say at least why your deputy director, as I understand it, has been on gardening leave now for some months. That's not appropriate for me to discuss the deputy director's personnel issues. So. In essence, is your concern that there was a yet further attempt to, to protect this agent? Well, that is the subject of a specific criminal investigation or a specific aspect of the ongoing criminal investigation, so I think it would not be proper for me to engage in discussion well, on that. Much has been written about previous inquiries into the Northern Ireland conflict, but none of these inquiries pose a threat to as many vested interests as Operation Canova. It goes beyond steak knife, military intelligence, and even the prosecution service to those charged with the defense of the realm. When the commanding officer of the force research unit, the military intelligence unit that ran steak knife, was interviewed by the police, I gather he replied testily, why are you interviewing me? MI5 was the recipient of our intelligence. We collected intelligence for MI5. They're the people you should be speaking to. Canova also extends to those IRA leaders said to have authorised the executions, some of whom are now senior politicians here. If there's any group uh, that might be uncomfortable with this investigation, it is the IRA, because if there is an agent um, engaged in a series of murders, then it was the IRA who sent them out to do them. That is why this case disturbs me so greatly, is because there was a, a potential complete corruption mm. of the, the judicial and legal process insofar as investigations, prosecutions and trials were concerned. I think Scapatici has the potential to pull the roof down on all sorts of people, whether at the top of the Republican leadership or whether within the intelligence community and beyond. Uh, and I'd be amazed if we get to that point. Because? Because it's too damaging for too many people. We'd like to have put the allegations in this programme to Freddy Scapatici, but a court order prevents us from even approaching him. The charge against the state is that blind eyes have been turned to multiple murder, including fellow agents of the state. So, to whom will the state now give its ultimate allegiance? Agent 6126 or those he prepared for death?